All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Joel Stevenson, who is in Boston. How are you doing, Joel? Yeah, doing well. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And Joel is the CEO of Yesware. Uh, so uh, yesware.com, if you want to go check that out, and we'll learn more about that later. But today, we're going to talk about the most common errors in sales business structures that keep you from being more efficient. And and I think, uh, Joel, one, one of the interesting things is I hear more and more efficiency becoming um, a, a mantra, right? Not that it shouldn't have always been one, but I think in in better times, people get lazy, people get allow inefficiencies to creep in because they can throw bodies at it or they can throw money at it. But when you enter periods like this, inefficiencies, you know, can really destroy you, right? Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, if you think about uh, from a revenue side, like how can you grow your revenue? There's, you know, two basic ways you can do that. You can either put more stuff into the top of your funnel or you can have your funnel convert more effectively. Mm -hmm. And in the good times, you think there tends to be more of an emphasis towards like, well, let's just put more in the funnel. Like let's spend more on marketing or let's try to open up a new channel or we're just like, we'll hire more reps and they'll do more outbound or like, we'll, we'll sort of really focus people on, you know, driving, you know, bigger amounts of, you know, outreach or whatever it ends up being. And then, yeah, when, when times get a little bit more lean, then the, the question often becomes more one of, okay, well, that didn't work or we were losing a lot of money doing that even though we were growing and now we have a mandate to not lose so much money or to or to be more profitable and so then a lot of times people start to think about okay well like how do i get my funnel or my sales reps or however you think about your funnel to perform better and inside so i think a lot of people are asking those questions in this very moment yeah, no, I'm absolutely. Uh, I used to always call it uh, the feel good funnel, you know, that one where you stuff everything into the early stages. And although you might be you might not be closing that much, you always go, yeah, but a couple of months down the road. <laughs> and of That's course, right. those couple of months, those couple of months keep moving and moving. Uh, so I, I think one of the things that it's uh, if there's an upside, you know, to a downside <laughs> is, is that it does force it does force you to take a, a hard look at how you um, how you qualify, what your sales process is, how you qualify. Because to your point, if you're going to have less in your system, you better have a higher uh, percentage rate of closing those. Yeah, that's right. And you know, not not even you know how you qualify, but like really spending you know the time you know doing you know higher quality outreach to a more targeted set of people, all that stuff makes a lot of sense. And, you know, you could argue that, I mean, efficiency could be spent in multiple different ways, right? Like if you're, if you're doing a good job qualifying, so you spend more time on the right set of customers, that's, that's one way to drive efficiency. Another way to drive efficiency might be to just save more time, not doing the same types of activities again, but using, you know, technology to help you automate some of those things so that you can spend more time on the right set of activities. It's, it's not so much of, um, you, know, you necessarily do more, but you maybe do the mm -hmm. things that you're doing already. You do them in a in a higher quality way than what you're currently doing. Um, yeah, and I think that's a that's an excellent point as well because I think one of the things that when times are good and and everything is we we start to forget about the fundamentals. We we start to be a little bit lazy and we don't pay attention to doing everything. Uh, as well as we might um i think this is a good uh, times like this force you to refocus and maybe go back to the fundamentals and make sure you're you're walking through the steps properly and you're preparing properly um because let's face it these opportunities that come your way are like gold right now yeah ab absolutely i think it's uh you know the people that you can have a good conversation with those tends those tend to be you know, hard fought uh, to get to that point. And you, you never really want to lose a deal. Like sometimes I think of it as similar to tennis, like forced versus unforced errors. You you never want to lose a deal due to a, due to an unforced error. Like you forgot mm -hmm. to follow up or, you know, you didn't prepare well for your call or you didn't ask good questions, you know, wh whatever it ends up being the things that you, things that are actually within your uh, control, I, I think is, um, you know, especially, I mean, it's always true, but I think especially now uh, you, you don't want to lose those. And, one thing that we see as a as a sales tech vendor is 
a lot of times people enter into sales tech like ours or there, you know, there are other, mm -hmm. uh, other people that, that do similar things. And they think that the sales tech is going to be a panacea because it saves them a lot of time. You know, they can, instead of sending one email, now they can send several thousand emails. And there's mm -hmm. a, there's an initial idea that, oh, well, that's the key. It's like, it's a hack and I'm going to now send out a jillion emails and that's going to then result in, uh, in a big funnel for me that I'm then going to convert it. Like very rarely works out that way. <laughs> Um, where you know you are going to get some time savings, but I think a lot of people have a, a bit of a, a rude awakening when they first try a tool like this and they sort of spam the world and they realize that mm -hmm. uh, you know not only did they not get the results that they want, they probably got a bunch of negative results that uh, yeah. they weren't even expecting or you know unexpected uh, unintentional consequences. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. I mean, when they, uh, you know, when when their domain reputation takes a hit, or they all end up in in spam folders. No, I I think that is a really is is a really good point. And you know, obviously, you know, we're a CRM vendor as well. Uh, is I think the as you said, I think sometimes people think that technology is going to fix your problems, right? As opposed to looking at what are the problems you're trying to fix. <laughs> <laughs> with the technology you know they tend to have it have it backwards and i do think that yeah when times get hard you know there is the there is the temptation just to 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 go big spray and pray and and spam the world but there's loads of other people doing it at the same time so your your target audience is getting bombarded from from all sides so if you want to stand out you've got to take a different approach exactly and you know, it's it maybe you know eight or ten years ago you could have gotten away with uh, a pretty unpersonalized, uh, high volume campaign because people just weren't used to that sort of thing. If it came from your individual email address, that might have been enough for people. But now, as you say, you know, we're our, all of our inboxes are full of these things, and I I sometimes tell people that the minute you look like you, the minute somebody thinks that they're in a campaign. Uh, you're in mm. trouble. Um, and so if you're not if you're not spending the time to customize those campaigns and deliver value for people, you know, don't be surprised if you don't end up in the inbox or you get marked as spam or, uh, you know, or, or you, you just people just hit delete and they don't res reply to you that the bar in our view has definitely gone up like pretty significantly for what it takes to get somebody's attention um, in, in the inbox. Um, yeah, so um, talk to me a little bit about that because I think that's a that's a problem that you know obviously is facing a, a lot of people, and a lot of people don't seem to have a solution because our inboxes keep filling up with the same mm -hmm. stuff. So yeah, um, what what is the solution to that? Uh, boy, I you know I, I wish I knew. I, I think there's um, I, maybe if if I zoom out for a minute at the problem. The problem is that there's sort of this, uh, it's almost like a tragedy of the commons type of thing where uh, salespeople have adopted sales technology uh, in large numbers now and without really knowing the best way to use that technology to their benefit. And so what you end up having is instead of a bunch of people using sales tech to, to spend more time delivering really thoughtful outreach to folks, you instead have people that, you know, send thousands of emails and you multiply that by, you know, 6 million non-retail mm -hmm. salespeople just in the U.S. And the result of that is a lot of filled up email inboxes. And so buyers, you know, have sort of recoiled from this and they put up more and more defense mechanisms, uh, you know, aided by vendors, uh, you know, or, or, you mm -hmm. know, or even just themselves, you know, just like delete, 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 um, you know, even, even before reading. And so I think the, I don't know if there's, I don't know what the short term fix is, but I believe the longer term fix is for people to really spend time uh, delivering value with with every exchange. And in the short run, I think what the, the best way to cut through the clutter is probably through some notion of networking. So, you know, if you can get a warm intro to somebody, either because you know somebody that they know or because you've done the work on the content side, either, you know, your own personal content that you're putting on the LinkedIn or your company's content on your web page, or, you know, uh, even like, you know, for example, what, what you're doing here, where you're, you're providing a bunch of business value that's separate from your company, mm -hmm. but people might learn about your company too. It's like, then somebody yep. can have a, a positive conversation with you with, you know, with that sort of opt in versus, uh, you know, mm -hmm. a forced opt out type of situation. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree with you. And I think that's where, 
I think that's where people, uh, you know, need to focus a bit more. And I think sometimes you need to take a step back and say, uh, what what makes me respond? Why why would I respond to something? Why why would I engage? Because I think it's it's an interesting phenomenon. I think sometimes is when we come through the door of our work, it's like we forget that we're also consumers, that we're also buyers or whatever. And then um, we do we do think and we do things to our prospects that we hate people doing to us. That's right. And we I think we've gotten past the point of maybe I remember three or four years ago, there was a lot of, uh, you know, sales development rep or business development rep shaming on LinkedIn, where somebody would say, Oh, I just got this ridiculous message. And this, this is a horrible yeah. person. And then sort of the, <laughs> the other side would come out and say like, Hey, they're just trying to do their job. Like I, there were these, you know, these massive flame wars happening on LinkedIn as a result of that. I don't see so much of that anymore. I think because people have just sort of gotten numb to it uh, because everybody gets so much. And so the, yeah, I think that the question that, um, you know, that is an interesting one um, is you say like, you know, what would it be like to, to actually interact with me as a human again, you know, versus some sort of almost machine to machine interaction? Like, what can you do to stand out? And to me, the, the best thing you can do is you could just provide value or, you know, one of our investors sometimes talks about this concept of give first and, mm -hmm. you know, make, make some investments in, in, um, in understanding somebody's business problem and, and try to help them along with that. Maybe before you, you know them, I think it's a lot different than, uh, hey, Joel, you know, like a, like a LinkedIn, <laughs> like you had a million of these in mails, like, hey, Joel, I'm really impressed with your background. Like we should connect <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. that type of stuff <laughs> is a lot different than, hey, I've been studying Yesware and I've looked at yeah. the way you approach such and such problem. And like, here's a here's a point of view on that or here's what we've seen competitors do, you know, some of that nature. Yeah, no, I know. I, I agree with you. I agree with you on that. And uh, LinkedIn is an interesting one, I think, because I think uh, it had started to happen pre pandemic, but over COVID, I mean, my goodness, it became a spam platform in many mm -hmm. ways where mm -hmm. everybody kind of defaulted to, to trying to, um, trying to, uh, prospect, um, through LinkedIn. And I think that a lot of people take a lazy approach. It's like, I mean, it's like maybe you post something on LinkedIn, right? A blog and, and somebody comes and goes, great blog, Joel, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and they think that's, you know, oh, I've I've commented, I've connected. Now I know when somebody goes, "Great blog, John." I know you haven't read it because if you read <laughs> right. it, you would have actually commented on something in the in the content. And I think that's where you know where people, if you're going to engage like that, you've got to put the work in. Absolutely, yeah. And you pro and and I would say you probably have to do do it consistently over time. Mm -hmm. And me, you know, one one source of potential inspiration there is if you look at some of the folks that have done a good job building up actually their own large follower bases on LinkedIn. I would say like, I, I don't have a big follower base on LinkedIn. It's not, we, you know, we, we post stuff there. I would say I'm not active sure. on it, but there are people that are. And, and, and if you watch what they do, one of the tactics that can be very effective is it, the person, and for them, they're sort of targeting people with very large audiences. And if you're mm -hmm. very first to that content with something thoughtful and you do that very consistently, then eventually, you know, some of the folks that are starting to look at uh, at that, at you know, whoever's content is is the is the originator of it, then they start to see you show up and you have thoughtful things to say. And I think the same thing can be true for more of a one to one sales process. If there's somebody that you're trying to reach, if you're quick to respond to their content with something that is actually value add, the mm -hmm. person is likely going to see it because people that are posting a lot of content are trying to understand if it's resonating with folks and who's looking at it and what's the conversation like. And so it's a great place to cut through all that clutter. But as you say, if it's like, hey, another great blog, Joel, like, you know, <laughs> yeah. not, yeah. not helpful. Yeah, no, exactly. And I, and I think uh, and I think that's a great lesson, I think, too, for for many salespeople and stuff. I know people say all the time or, you know, the mantra was, oh, you have to post, create your own content. You've got to post your content. And and I always felt like, what well, if everybody's posting content, like who's actually reading it? Mm -hmm. um, uh, whereas I think to your point is if you have honed in on some targets that you think are interesting for you, um, then if you engage properly, like you just outlined there, if you engage with them and consistently over time, that's that's probably a far better use of your time than, you know, just throwing out content for the sake of it and then wondering why it's not having an impact. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, it, I think there's 
there's certainly there's benefit to sales reps sharing the 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 content that your company is putting out, particularly if mm -hmm. it's if it's well done content that's going to help your target audience. But yeah, I I, I tend to agree that uh, you know for a lot of people that are sitting in that account executive role. Um, you probably don't, I mean, you know, even just the time is probably a question like, but the time to really build quality content that's well-researched and is really going to be, you know, value add to, to whatever community is that you're trying to reach. I think it, it's, it's much more likely that you're going to be able to add value to a specific, to somebody else's content where they're, they've posed a specific question or there's an interesting angle that you can sort of explore with that person. Uh, I, my sense is that that's generally going to be a better approach for folks that are spending a lot of time in the in the selling motion. Yeah, absolutely. And um, one one thing I just wanted to come back to an interesting comment you made earlier, and and I and I agree with it. I think uh, you know there's been there's been an explosion of sales tools, right? Clearly, over the last uh, you know number of years, you only have to go to review sites and put in anything you can put in CRM, sales enablement, whatever, and you'll see tons and tons of of solutions, but back to your point is, um, you know, I think companies need to be a lot more discerning going forward because I think, uh, again, when times are good, I mean, you're just buying buying technologies and throwing them in there, not looking at how they work with other technologies. Or one person discovers and says, "Hey, this is great," and everybody goes, "Oh, silver bullet, let's run over here," and then they run over there and they go, "Oh, silver bullet didn't doesn't exist." Oops, and back over here. Um, when you when you talk to when you talk to you know your 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 clients and customers like how do you how do you help them really focus in on on how this your particular technology is going to help them and how it's going to work with everything else as opposed to just like here's another tool quickly it's another it's another great silver bullet for you yeah well i i remember a little bit back to my time before i joined yesware i was running a mm -hmm. Uh, the B2B division of Wayfair. And so oh, okay. I was sort of on the buyer side for a while. Yeah. And I remember, it, 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 and one of the reasons I got actually interested in in Yesware and sales technology was we made a big investment into that and we saw, uh, you know, large benefits um, in terms of productivity. And so I, I sort of got religion about um, the space and, and, and what it was about. And so, but I remember just sort of the bewilderment of, uh, so many vendors and everybody says they do the same thing and it's hard to know mm -hmm. what's going to work with what and you know you, you i think as um as a sales organization we're probably already wired a little bit to be fickle kind of at the <laughs> kind of at, at, at the outset and so you, you do get a lot of that shiny new thing syndrome showing up I, our approach at yes where i suppose is you know for in many respects we're we try to think of ourselves as a bottoms up or product led company. And so normally when we're starting to have a conversation with somebody the our preferred approach is that somebody's already started to use the tool and has had success with it inside the company. And so we sort of point to a person and what they've done and, and say, Hey, you know, here's a problem that X, Y, Z person is solving through Yesware. And they sort of did it of their own mm -hmm. volition because you weren't solving it for them, but now look at what they're doing and there's sort of power and, you know, more than one person doing it and a, a more thoughtful approach. And here's how we integrate to Salesforce or LinkedIn or, or, or whatever it ha happens to be. Um, ideally, that's where it happens. I think what we, where we have some, uh, some strength or competitive ad advantage in the market is from a usability standpoint is yes, we're, again, as a product led organization, we're really designed for usability. What we see a lot of are uh, you know, the classic sort of shelfware uh, tech, which is, you know, oftentimes originates from just what you said, where somebody gets an idea that this thing is going to be great and a vendor shows up and they charge them a lot of money for something and then it never gets implemented right. Or, and there, there's myriad reasons for that. But we, a lot of times we end up, uh, we end up looking good in that comparison because we, you know, we tend to have very high usability. So we're really focused on, you know, getting the reps what they need so they can be more productive, they can save time, they can, you know, craft better, uh, better outreach and follow up more effectively with folks like that, that. We're really trying to zero in on those micro problems. Um, and then that can bubble up into some macro problems that we help with. But we're, um, you know, for us, we're really trying to be, you know, kind of rep focused first, which tends to help with, uh, with adoption. 
Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And obviously, that this is the kind of same approach that uh, we have, as you said, been, um, you know, we it's built by users for users. Um, and I think that and I think that's uh, and I like what you said about solving the micro problems, because I do think that sometimes what happens is everybody just tries to go for the big, huge issue that's or or it's such a blanket issue. It's like we need to. We need more lead. We need to drive more leads, and that's it. I mean, that's that's the that's the problem, and then it's throw all of this stuff at it. And I think often it's it's not the, it's not defining the problem is the problem, <laughs> right? Or you know, and I think the you know the legacy. I wouldn't put you in that camp, but if you think about like the legacy CRM systems, oh, yeah. were you know I remember doing an Orem, helping with an Orem installation, and I'm dating myself in like the late nineties. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, back then the, the selling proposition was all about, well, you know, your reps might leave and they're going to take their data with them. And like, you don't yeah. want them to take the Rolodex, like you need to keep the Rolodex. And so I think from the very early stages, CRM was about kind of command and, and control yeah. of the information. It wasn't really about like helping the reps do better with, mm -hmm. um, with, with what they have. And, and I think you, you still see some of that where, you know, you get in certain organizations, you get maybe a particular ops team or or maybe a, a revenue leader that thinks that they have all the answers without actually talking to the reps and spending sufficient time, you know, side by side with the reps. And so then uh, these solutions come in top down and they don't get good adoption because the reps don't mm -hmm. understand why they ha have been implemented or they're too complicated, or they're too hard to understand. Like there, there's any number of reasons, but I think we still have a you know, as an industry, we still have a lot of that, like, you know, I, as the management team or the operations team, you know, know what's best and you should just shut up and do it. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, the class, I, I sometimes, I sometimes talk about it as, uh, especially for, I think, uh, younger, higher velocity sales organizations, there's an unwritten handshake between the, uh, between sort of the powerful ops team and, and the sales organization, which is, you guys can keep your beer kegs and your Nerf guns and you'll make good money, but you just do what we tell you to do. And the minute you deviate from what we tell you to do, because we're the smart ones, we all went to fancy mm -hmm. schools and we've got good degrees, like you're out, <laughs> you yeah. know? And so, and, and I, and you see a lot of, in those organizations, you see a lot of the very heavy handed command and control um, types of systems that, you know, a lot of reps like just don't like, but they sort of have to live with. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. And obviously, you know, what it does end up is um, with poor adoption or with lip service or whatever. So then all of these great, uh, all of the all of the great data that the lead, the, 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 the ops team or whoever was boasting about is, is garbage because it's mm -hmm. not uh, it's not properly filled out. No, I totally agree with you. Absolutely. Well, listen, Joel, this is great. Uh, all of Joel's information is going to be below this video. But before you go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and Yesware. Uh, yeah, well, if uh, you, you know, yes, sir, yes, we're a sales enablement tool. And so we, you know, we help people uh, drive efficiency in their sales process. We integrate very deeply into the inbox, so whether that's uh, Gmail or Outlook. And uh, if you want to learn more about Yesware, we've got a, a, a free tier of Yesware you can use forever at, at yesware.com. And we've got a lot of great content um, on the blog, which you can also get to from, from yesware.com. Fantastic. Well, listen, thanks again, Joel. Uh, thank you for watching and listening. I'll see you all again very soon. Thank you.